Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report, and at least twice a month we have the amazing Jonathan Gray. His website is before us, B-E-F-O-R-E-U-S dot com, and I consider him probably one of the greatest academic, uh, my, uh, what I call skeptical academic Christian minds out there, and you need a skeptic to actually go through the facts and collate the facts from ancient history, from astronomy, from astrology, etc., to understand the depth of the proof that, number one, God exists, number two, that his his incarnation is Yeshua HaMashiach, which means the Father in the flesh. Uh, he came 2,000 years ago. The evidence in uh, The Forbidden Secret is probably one of the most important books you've written, but you have many at beforeus.com. And we're up to chapter 29. Let's uh, proceed with chapter 29. What, where are we, and what, roughly what page are we on on the ebook? Well, uh, it would be round about page 378, to Bill, somewhere around there. Around 378. Okay, let's start. Well, we're talking about, we'll start off with the mindset that blocks evidence because that's quite important. We've got to get our minds straightened out first before we, we can take in some things, and the attitudes often prevent us from doing that. No kidding. In other words, an intelligent mind doesn't mean it isn't a prerequisite for having the truth. Uh, well, you know, evidence might be conclusive and often overwhelming, but it does not necessarily produce conviction. Right. And the will and the affections must necessarily enter into it. Um, I had a couple of visitors in my home this week, and, and one, was, uh, one was a lady, one was a man, and the lady was not doing something that she knew she should be doing, uh, which is affecting her family, and so my other friend hit, really hit her straight front on and said, why aren't you doing this? You know it's right. And she said, well, I have to be convicted. And that's the essence of it, isn't it? Oh, my. Yeah, that's quite true. So let's continue on Chapter 29. Where are we? Okay. Well, you know, once a man's committed himself to a certain position, I deal with a few of these every now and again, um, a man who publicly commits himself to a position and then he's shown that this is not correct, um, unless he's very, very honest, it's very difficult to look at the evidence impartially and especially so when private interests are involved. And we're dealing here with a psychological situation, the subtleties of the human mind, which can be very deceptive. And doesn't the scripture say that the, the, the mind is deceptive above all things? Oh yes, in it. fact, uh, it, most people don't realize that the human mind is only capable of continually doing evil because it doesn't have the total a whole facts. Only an obs uh, omniscient, eternal mind is capable of doing good. And until we have the direction from the Most High God, we will do continually evil. Oh, absolutely. And our opinions become fixed to the point where ultimately we even stop thinking and, and thinking about it. And this can lead to dangerous mistakes unless one is a truth seeker, definitely a serious about seeking the truth, and examines every matter carefully with an eye focused on facts that are not disputed. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we had a really I, I good discussion last week on the chapter 28. Uh, what are some of the facts that you put out in chapter 29? Well, uh, the fact that there, there were, I think I'd be brought out about 10 reasons why the, the Jewish leaders uh, rejected Jesus. But maybe I'll, I'll just list those off because uh, it doesn't hurt to go back over those again. It's very important, really. Okay. They were biased against him. It hurt their, what he said hurt their national pride, his, his, his lack of um, wanting to overthrow Roman rule. His humble way of life offended their snobbery. He had not been taught by them. His character showed them up. And in argument, he outclassed them. Uh, I like that one because um, they used to come and ask him one difficult question after another, trying to trap him into saying something that they could condemn him for. And yet his mind was so keen, it was more than a match for them. And he had a, a beautiful way of telling little stories and asking them to comment. And often in their response, they condemned themselves before they realized that they were the culprit in the story. Yeah, and that's funny. <laughs> yeah, and it, clearly he outclassed them, and that made them furious. There was no one like Jesus Christ on earth, uh, the mind of God. Right, exactly. His growing popularity endangered their influence. They feared incurring the wrath of Rome. 
And uh, then uh, there's a couple of reasons why the common people in general rejected him and became the, the roaring crowd that cried out, crucify him. They were asked by Jesus to leave the majority and follow a little group that was insignificant. And they were asked to forsake all and follow him. Uh, even that could lose them their life. So to accept his claims was not necessarily easy. It meant there's a lot of rethinking to be done, uh, Bill. And if you know why they rejected Jesus, uh, you only have to look around and see why people reject him today. It hurts their pride to think that we're sinners in need of a saviour. Exactly. And it doesn't just require a superficial surface change, but a total transformation of one's life. Well, after all, that's what it's about. I think we all realise that our lives have a lot uh, to uh, to be improved on, but this is not just turning over a new leaf. It's closing the old book and it's starting a totally new book. That's what his infilling presence means in our lives. Exactly. Now, you, you have some interesting stories in this uh, chapter. Yeah. Well, now... Um, when we have a mindset that blocks the evidence, uh, as these people did back there, the elite of his day uh, manipulated, ultimately, the historical facts to cover up the, their dishonesty in rejecting him. And perhaps we we'll spend a few minutes on that today. Later in the book, uh, I've got a whole chapter on it which goes in a lot of detail, and maybe we should save it for then, but maybe we'll just go a little bit into it today. Yeah. And this is one of the most amazing manipulations of historical facts ever performed in history. It happened in three stages, as I see it. Firstly, they rejected the Messiah. Secondly, the time for the Messiah expired, according to the prophet Daniel. And thirdly, once the year count had expired, they had to fiddle with years of history to make it appear to end at a later date so that their present rejection would not um, be too much of a pointer against them and they could say well the prophecy of Daniel is not fulfilled yet it's coming very soon exactly. now the rabbis did have their calculations right but they rejected the coming one when he arrived and uh, so when they did so and the time of his coming had gone by they actually corrupted the Jewish chronology and shortened the duration of the kingdom of Persia so that they could apply Daniel's prophecy to men like uh, Judas and Judas of Galilee and at length to Bar uh, Kajot. Yeah, it's now, amazing, isn't it? That they would actually it, change the dates and the time period so they could actually label someone else a potential messiah. Oh, yeah. Uh, they cut out about 160 years of, of, act of real history from their own history to do that. Okay. So if you don't like the other Messiah, you build your own Messiah. You do that, yeah. So you, you, just to recapitulate re, uh, that, everyone knew the Messiah must come within 490 years after the decree of the Persian king. Artaxerxes, who gave the command to restore Jerusalem, and Daniel had predicted that. But the 490 years had now completed its time, and uh, since the official story given to the people was the Messiah had not yet come, so it became necessary now to cut out some years of earlier history from Artaxerxes, uh, that's the Persian uh, Empire's reign, so that uh, the decree could be redated to start the prophecy. And this would give them opportunity to promote someone else who just might be acceptable to the people for the purpose of overthrowing the Roman occupation. And so this is why that happened. Very smooth ploy. Very clever. Yeah, very clever. Evil and clever. And also stupid in a way because, like, can you second-guess God? Why would they do this? Thinking they're going to get away with it. Yeah, I think they think get away with it, but they like, have to face their creator. Yeah, not only that, they'd have to face the derision down the road from other so-called scholars who say that didn't work. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, now, uh, eminent authorities, and one of the first that discovered this was Sir Isaac Newton, way, way back. Amazing. Yeah, he's a biblical scholar for sure.
Welcome back, and let's continue this remarkable chapter with the amazing author, Jonathan Gray, BeforeUs.com. Uh, and, of course, there's lots of reasons why Yeshua is rejected, uh, which basically means a father in the flesh. People need to understand that, uh, that Jesus is the incarnation of the vast creator of the universe. Uh, that's why he had omniscient knowledge. When people asked him questions, he already had the answer. That's why he taught when he was 12 years of age. His ministry started then. Yeah. Uh, he didn't need to be taught. He knew. In other words, when people asked him questions, he gave them the full and straight, simple and elegant answer. Uh, but that really riled people. They don't want to have a spiritual savant that literally walks in and knows everything, literally. Yeah. Well, um, the, the, the Jewish Babylonian Sanhedrin is an interesting document. It, it dates from about um, AD 95 to 110. And it testifies uh, to the fact that, well, uh, to quote it, on the eve of Passover, Yeshua was hanged. For 40 days before the execution took place, a herald went forth and cried, He's going forth to be stoned because he's practiced magic and led Israel astray. Anyone who can say anything in his favor, let him come forward and plead on his behalf. But since nothing was brought forward in his favor, he was hanged on the eve of Passover. They admit that, but even though they've twisted the history a little bit there. And uh, they say that a a another version of the same text says that Jesus' magic and miracle acts did take place, but he led astray many in Israel. And the time of the crucifixion, the fact of the crucifixion, and the intent of the Jewish religious leaders behind the killing is all admitted. And uh, so we have uh, around about AD 95 another Jewish rabbi, Eliezer ben uh, Hieronymus. Uh, he speaks of Jesus' magic arts. So they didn't deny that he worked miracles, but they claim these were acts of sorcery. And despite the hatred of many Jewish leaders for Jesus Christ and Christianity, they never question the historical reality of Jesus. They admit he is part of their history, and they still recognize this today, Jewish leaders. I have people sometimes saying, well, where's the evidence that Jesus ever lived? Well, you don't have to go any further than his enemies. The, the testimony of enemies it should be pretty solid testimony of his existence, surely. I had somebody argue with me uh, a few weeks ago saying that there was... Uh, there was no evidence that Jesus existed in these myths. I said, there's more evidence that Jesus exists than you and I right on the air right now. I said, oh, what yeah. are you talking about? I said, there's more evidence that he exists right from the Jews themselves. They admit it. There's stones written there that actually have his name on it right there in Caesarea Philippi and other areas in Israel. So when people say that, it's asinine. It's like saying, looking at you and saying you don't have hands. And you're holding your hands up right in front of their face. It's It's craziness. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it's interesting that the very name Jesus was for Jews a symbol of all that is abominable. And this popular tradition still persists today, Dr. Bill. Oh, yeah. In fact, they even tried to twist the name and said it was a means he was the opposer of the Jews. He was a destroyer. They even tried to, re to deposit the idea of Satanism upon the name Jesus to say that he was the opposer and destroyer. Oh, yes, I do. And, and I interpret uh, the name Yeshu, the Hebrew name of Jesus, as an acronym for the curse. May his name and memory be wiped out. Yeah, they called me Yesha, right? In other words, instead of yeah. Yeshua, they saw Yesha. And, of course, Yesha, Yesha. means curse, right? Yeah. In fact, anti-Zionist Orthodox Jews um, sometimes refer to uh, Herzl as Herzl Jesus. And, and this is found in religious Zionist writings, expressions like NASA Jesus and more recently Arafat Jesus and so on. Yeah, it's amazing. So anybody who doesn't think, you know, I, I heard somebody say that they were in, in a... Uh in a shipyard in Seoul, South Korea, and there was somebody who was non-Christian, and they were they were cursing, and uh, they cursed in the name of G. You know, they said, you know, JC, and I said, I said the demons that were tapping on that man's shoulder after he kind of probably hurt himself doing something on the shipyard wanted to make certain he had the correct name when he cursed. Interesting. Yeah. Well, uh, they certainly have a vested interest in that, and, and all this hostility against him comes from them anyway. Yeah, so this yeah. is not a human battle, humans against humans. This is a divine, spiritual evil that from uh, Lucifer himself, Satan himself against Jesus, because he was yeah. cast out. He was cast yeah. out of heaven. 
Yeah, in fact, that's the ultimate battle. People don't realize this is another thing, is millennialism is also something that's Masonic, that we were given two millennia of grace. In fact, the casting out of heaven, the casting down of Satan occurred at the, uh, at the cross, that Satan has been cast out of the, of the uh, second heaven, and actually that's why we're in such a disarray right now that uh, Satan is, is a great and very wrathful because he no longer has access to the throne room of heaven. That's true, yes. You know, some critics who kid themselves that Jesus never really existed argue that the Jewish references that we were just referring to a few minutes back must apply to some other character. But my, my answer to that would be to ask a question of them. What would evoke such continuing strong feelings against Jesus as we to hear today? If this was simply some unknown Jesus who was connected with a comparatively insignificant event sometime in the past and is not connected with Christianity, which has now become a mighty force. Now, that's why emotions rage so hot. There's no mistaking the fact that this is the Jesus of Christianity they're talking about. Right. It's now, historical what I, in their minds as Hitler, Adolf Hitler himself. Exactly. Now, there's a, another Jesus uh, taught by by Muhammad and Islam. And we, of course, have all these, uh, the stupid video that was put out by uh, an ex-drug addict and so on that aggravated the Muslims. And some people are stupid enough, like Susan Rice from the State Department, that these are the reasons why the Muslims went crazy. No, their version, first off, even if they have you know hats that say, we love Jesus, their version of Jesus is not is just a prophet who still got things wrong and needed to have Muhammad to kind of set things straight. It's not the son of God, meaning the incarnation of the creator God, as a physical human being on the planet. They they believe that qualitatively that Muhammad is superior to Jesus. Yes, they do. Uh, I, I have some very beautiful Muslim people on my newsletter list who, who I'm interacting with at the moment, and some of them are opening their eyes for the first time. I'm, glad, I'm very happy, very encouraged to see it, and I'm praying for them. Well, the thing that Islam, like any religion, whether it's Mormonism, Islam, transhumanism, you can never can achieve spiritual or intellectual peace because man isn't capable of actually raising himself up by his bootstraps to have an eternal salvation or a sense of eternal destiny or reason to exist. As I wrote many years ago with the thing called the Columbine High Lord's Prayer, uh, with that God gave me supernaturally, uh, and I read it on KKLA Radio in Los Angeles after Columbine in the year two, in early 2000, in January 2000, in Los Angeles. And uh, the fact is that without without God dwelling within us, without the fusion of our soul and submission to the Spirit of the Most High God, we can't have peace. We can't have any real knowledge of anything that's goodness. We may have the illusion of it. We never have any eternal uh, peace that we know that we're going to, you know, vaporize into the, the annals of history or nothingness and our civilization is a little blip on, on the planet Earth. But in the eyes of the Most High God, we're eternally and infinitely precious, and we become eternal beings when we submit to the will of the Most High God. It makes it totally different. It's effortless to become saved. Yeah, sure thing. Effortless. It takes no effort at all. The doing happens after the love relationship arrives. back to the Nutramedical Report, and of course, uh, the, that, that's why when people say, well, we don't have proof of the uh, existence of Yeshua, as I mentioned just on the break, I was talking, giving a bit of my testimonial, because people need to understand that without God, we are malignantly evil. We are not capable of good. It's all just a matter of our circumstances. Look at the wonderful German people. If you were to visit Germany before the Holocaust, Germany before the rise of Adolf Hitler, if you were to see the rise of even wonderful people in the ancient world before they became devilishly evil empires doing evil things, you realize a lot of their leaders led them away to do evil things because the human heart, when it's led by either false leaders or by evil or just by the logic of our own ideas in our mind, you know, the road to uh, hell is paved by good intentions um, but it's really important to understand that Yeshua God is there to to bring us back to become what we are which is man not human or serpent man but man made in the image of the Most High God that when we hear his voice that's why he's named the Logos the voice uh, we can become what we are as the children of the Most High God we have authority too. then we have authority to receive gifts 
to actually do things, but you don't get those because you're so wonderful. You get those because you have a relationship. If you're a son of God, he's going to treat you like one. He's going to dress you in raiment. He's going to put a crown on you. He's going to give you a scepter and say, now now that you're my son or daughter, go and, and rule. He doesn't want you to just stand there. He wants you to stand up for the truth, whether it's protecting the unborn or the elderly or talking against evil and calling things what they are. We want to have repentance of the people that are now under the boot of Islam. Many of these are actually ancient Hebrew people or Jewish people. Uh, people in the Middle East were actually put to the sword if they weren't going to convert to Islam and are genetically and by blood groups ancient Hebrews. And uh, the brewing conflict in the Middle East is a conflict brewed by Satan to make sure that he wipes out the blood of Abraham. That's what it's all about. Yes, it's bigger than politics reveals. Because exactly. The political it's, leaders it, it, don't even know what they're involved in. No, they have no idea that they're actually involved with a satanic ritual for Satan to wipe out the blood of Abraham and his descendants that used to be ancient Christians and Hebrews and Jews. And that's what he hates, yeah. Yeah, he hates it. He hates the blood. And uh, if you don't understand that, you're really... You'll, you'll, you'll be like a bug against a glass. You'll never get it. You'll never really understand why these philosophies and policies and plans and evil exist in the world. It's because there's a world that is superimposed upon ours that's, that's spiritual, that's more real than this planet that we live in. Okay, so now in Jesus of Nazareth, it's the real Jesus of Nazareth that is associated with uh, the scriptural prophecies and Christianity today. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God in the flesh, is whom the Jewish leaders rejected and whom they recognized as an historical figure. Right. And as we've seen, the prophecies did state that the Messiah would come before the destruction of the temple and the final exile of the Jews. Now, during the Roman siege of Jerusalem, as famine and fear raged right through the city, the religious leaders, who had a very tight control over the people there, kept reassuring them, look, we're secure. The city will stand. Why? Because Messiah hasn't come yet, and the prophecy says he won't come that the, the temple will remain and he will visit it and it will not be destroyed till after he's come and so because he hasn't come we know Jerusalem is going to stand the Romans will not win this war so hold on, Jerusalem is going to survive well very right. soothing words but fatal yeah exactly and uh, it's probably safe uh, from what I've been reading from Josephus and, and, uh, and other records of the time it's probably safe to say that human suffering never anywhere reached a greater degree of intensity and awfulness as at the siege of Jerusalem prior to its destruction in AD yeah. 70. I think they said there was 1.7 million crosses where they crucified Jews uh, and other people that did not believe in Yeshua because the Christians received a word of knowledge that they should leave the city and, uh, and the Christian believers that were originally Jews and other faiths that became believers left. They knew before that Titus was coming because the Spirit told them to. Yes, they did. And it's interesting that the Jewish Encyclopedia today acknowledges that all the Christians got out and not one of them lost their lives. Isn't that interesting? So it tells us mm. the same thing. That even if you're fearful now about, oh, how do I prepare for what's coming? The preparation number one before food, water, bullets, or anything else is to have a relationship with the Most High God. And when God speaks to you, you have to shema. You have to hear and do. If he says, pick up and leave now, even if your food is in your home and you've got only so much in your car, you've got to listen to the Spirit of God and do it. That's going to be real tough to let God be the Lord of your life during a crisis. But people need to realize, without that, you won't physically survive, you won't economically survive, and you won't spiritually survive. This situation is going to be repeated. Yeshua himself said so. He was asked a double-barreled question. When, uh, when will the temple be destroyed and what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the world? And he gave the same seven signs which led up to both those two events. And we're seeing today the seven signs that were enacted before Jerusalem fell. We're seeing it today in the world before our world comes down. Right. In a sense, Jerusalem is about to fall again. What I mentioned in the first hour, we had Carl Gallops on, is, is my thesis, which will be coming out in the first of the trilogy, uh, books called uh, Clay and Iron, Time of Sorrows, which is a follow-up of Clay and Iron. The thesis that what we're heading for is an outbreak, not of war, but of peace. 
where um, Mohammed Morsi has already made the statement that he wants to have rethink his plan and his his agreements and make an agreement with Iran in Syria rather than a plan for war. And if there's an ancient Muslim, and it's long before Muslim, long before Christianity or even Judaism, there's an ancient saying going back over 5,000 years to the Middle East, me and my brother against my cousin, me and my cousin against my enemy. And uh, so Islam will unify. You'll see also a peace treaty breakout with the uh, Muslim caliphate uh, put in place by the globalists and the banksters that will make this agreement that will partition the state of Israel and bring on the covenant with death. And I believe that we're facing not only economic moves by the United States because the mark of the beast is not going to come from your nation, Auckland, New Zealand, or Belgium, or from Russia or China. It's coming from the United States, and it's going to come from the state of Colorado, Shriver Air Force Base, Falcon, Colorado. That's, That's interesting. You should bring out the from the United States because I believe this for quite a few years. I believe the evidence in the scripture is that well, the United States will take the lead in the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast comes from the U.S. In fact, yeah, I received it will, in prayer. It will be engineered and uh, right yeah. from there. Yeah, 1988, I received in prayer, and uh, I was taken specifically to the to, to the city, actually, and it, from which the mark would come. And I was told, shown all these things supernaturally. That I later became an employee of CECOM, Colorado Center for Ahmed, the U.S. Space Command Strategic Defense Star Wars, the Virtual World Project, which, by the way, they're trying to bring in step by step, including the real ID. And when people say they dispute it, I said, look, I'll give you the evidence. We have three major external databases in West Virginia and another one in Texas and a huge one they're building now, the largest one ever built in Utah. It's over 3 million square feet with literally uh, you know, these giant quantum computers. But the biggest database is underground at Falcon. It's actually using Cray-5 gallium arsenide quantum computing. And people don't understand that what's going on is they are building a biometric world currency and it will be administered by the United States because it's the world reserve currency. The world will be ruled by a virtual currency coming from the United States. People say, oh, that can't be. America is a just and righteous nation. No, it's not. America is both the daughter of Zion and the daughter of Babylon. It is the dragon nation. The word America in ancient Mesoamerican actually means the land of the dragon. It's not from Amaruki Vospezi, the, uh, the Portuguese map maker. It's actually from ancient Mesoamerican language that means this is the land of Quetzal or Kuku Khan or the serpent god, the dragon. You know, it's interesting that in, in a book of Revelation, it, spe it speaks of this power that will speak as a dragon, and I've always understood that to be the United States. It is the United States. Let me explain the power that America has. When nations like Russia, and I, I remember talking to a man in storage tech who was in the Russian Strategic Rocket Forces, and he was working in the storage tech up in uh, north of Denver. And he said, we are always afraid of you Americans because we knew when you gave us nuclear and other technology, you must have much worse weapons to destroy us if we ever think we launch on you. And I said, smart move. America has weapons centuries ahead of you, and we'll push a button and you'll cease to exist. Welcome back, and uh, let's continue with this remarkable chapter. This is, uh, this is important people kind of grasp this. They're going to hear things in this program, in this analysis of your remarkable books, they're not going to hear anywhere else. They're not going to hear on so-called Christian radio or television. They're going to hear knowledge and wisdom and a level of weapons, spiritual weapons, to, if they get these books at beforeus.com, that's going to transform them not trying to convince them something against their will, but trying to convince them by changing their perspective, presenting them with facts, and actually show them a spiritual way, I call it the way, which is what the church was called before it was taken over by Constantine, so they can understand that there is only one way of salvation, there's only one way of peace on earth, there's only one prince of peace, and he's not Obama, and he's not Mr. Vladimir Putin or anybody else, he's not the new caliphate and Mr. Mohammed Kor or Morsi of, of Egypt, who's wanting to make a dialogue with Iran so the Third World War won't happen. No, the Prince of Peace is Yeshua HaMashiach, the Father in the flesh, Jesus Christ. And if we don't submit to that, our planet is doomed, our population is doomed, our souls are doomed. And people think, oh, I'll just get reincarnated. Not, not, that's another big lie, another satanic lie that's just so disturbing that people believe that foolishness. 
Yes, certainly do. Right. It's probably, as I mentioned earlier, safe to say that human suffering never on history anywhere reached a greater degree as it did in Jerusalem prior to AD 70. And it was all by the, re the rejection of Messiah Yeshua, isn't it? Yes, all because of that. And, and the physical suffering was unparalleled. I don't think it was any, a greater intensity in the, in the siege of Stalingrad or anywhere on earth in history as there was in Jerusalem prior to its destruction. And yet, the physical suffering was nothing compared to the anguish of a people who sense they had been forsaken by God. Just look at it this way. I think this is the saddest part of the whole story. During the siege, many Jews expected divine intervention, and their rabbis were telling them that it couldn't happen, that there could be no destruction. And to the very last, they held out, assured of eventual deliverance, because, after all, did not the prophecies say that the city and the temple will not fall until after Messiah has come? Job, Jacob said it, Micah said it, Haggai, Daniel, they all agreed, everyone. And in a more than a thousand years of Hebrew history, never had any biblical prophecy been known to fail. Of that they were certain. And the word of God, which cannot fail, said Messiah had to come first before Jerusalem could ever fall. But now here, before their very eyes, the temple is falling. Here comes destruction of everything. Everything around them. And the Messiah hasn't come. So what had gone wrong? Now, can you just grasp that, Bill, the utter anguish, the unspeakable despair, the black hopelessness that now fell upon those who believed they were God's chosen ones? Right, and of course, that's probably the root of why they become even more apostate and why the Pharisees have become the modern Sabbatean Jews who believe in things like the cockatrice, which is a serpent seed. And they believe that literally the, the Jewish people themselves, many of these rabbis are teaching, they follow the, the holy serpent. Is their is their is their chief prince in the sense that they believe that they need, need to follow the, the the serpent god as their representation. People because say, no, they that's rejected not. they rejected the very one that could have them. Exactly. So in other words, uh, we're not dealing with ancient Hebrews like Torah Jews. We're dealing with the modern edifice of modern Judaism it is completely satanic. Yeah. And so is Islam. It's completely satanic. And so is high-level uh, Knights of Columbus, Roman Catholicism, and so is Buddhism, and so is transhumanism. In other words, every other ism other than a real relationship with the Most High God is satanic. And uh, people don't get this, that they don't realize that's probably part of the reason why most Jews now are just leftist and secular agnostics, because it's so noxious. The truth about what's really inside Judaism they can't withstand it, so therefore they don't believe in any God. So most Jews nowadays are agnostics or atheists. It's too hard to face the truth. I can understand that. I can right. understand that. And, 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 and I heard more from other Jews that have told me, they said, well, God left, abandoned us again during the Holocaust. And I've even had a Jew show me his numbers, you know, when he was in a, in a concentration camp. I said, mm. I said, well, I said, if the Jews had not rejected Yeshua HaMashiach, the original Messiah, the Jews wouldn't have suffered the foolishness of uh, Jesus Bar Kokhba and the, and the uh, invasion and the destruction of the Roman Emperor uh, that destroyed the city of Jerusalem and killed 1.7 million Jews and, and crucified them on the hills like Yeshua. I said, so... I said, you know, these are consequences. You know, God is not a God to be mocked. And he doesn't do it, but he tries to tell us things to prevent this from happening because it's our free will that marches us toward destruction. It's not God's will. God's will is always for us to have better and do well. It's never to die early from disease or bad, stupid decisions or, uh, you know, promulgating evil, evil against people or nations. But the problem is people want to blame God. They always say, hey, God, he's just let me alone. He didn't do this. Thinking, and they're puffing on a cigarette wondering why they got lung cancer. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Or they're sticking I, needles it, in their it, arms with they're sharing with their friends and they've got AIDS. It's like, yeah. no, I don't think you can blame God for that. We suffer the consequences of our choices. And the consequences of our ancestors and our fathers. It says the sins of the fathers are visited upon their children and their children's children. The yeah. sins of the ancient Pharisees are visited on all the Jews down through the ages, and they became more apostate. Or in the 1600 years that they spent in Babylon, they absorbed all of the nastiness of ancient Babylon, all the demonic activities in the Kabbalah, and they perverted the original mathematics that uh, Jews knew, and even the star signs that you've taught, 
uh, to become a horror and to become something to manipulate and control and literally to try to control the demonic forces and powers of darkness to actually manipulate history. The, the, the Kabbalists actually think that by, by using the Kabbalah and by using these spiritual forces, they're literally summoning demons to do their bidding and change the direction of history, the timeline. Yeah, yeah. Believe it or not, people say, oh, that's not the case nowadays. I said, I'm sorry, if you get a rabbi to be real honest with you, and their use of the Kabbalah and there's various rituals, etc., they're no different than uh, <laughs> looking at some of these big blockbuster movies. They're no different than wizards and warlocks. So true. Now, uh, what, we, what we're looking at here is, is, is a, a parallel. I'd just like for, to, for any uh, dear Jewish man or woman who's listening in here and would just like a, an ultimate question to think about. Right. Uh, let's look back through history. We note that the Jewish temple was destroyed with the Jerusalem city on two particular occasions. And each time, the nation was dragged into or driven into exile. Now, the first time was in 586. Right. And that was for the rejection of the prophets sent by God. And uh, the, their own book, First Chronicles, says, But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his word, scoffed at the prophets till there was no remedy. And so they were dragged into Babylon. Now, there's a biblically stated reason uh, for the first desolation. It was specifically because they rejected the prophets who had been sent to bring them back to God. Now let's fast forward to AD 70 when it happens the second time with the Roman siege. Right. Could it be that the reason this time was for the rejection of a greater prophet, even the Messiah himself, right. sent from God? And it, it gets more amazing, Bill. The date of the temple being burnt by the armies of Babylon in 586 was the 10th day of the month Ab. The date of the temple being burnt by Roman armies in AD 70 was the 10th day of the month Ab. The very same date. When I realized that, it sent a chill up my spine. Tens of Av, yeah. That's what they call them, the days of Av. Yeah. And my question would be, if the first captivity of 70 years was an adequate consequence for the rejection of their ancient prophets, what can be the enormity of the national sin that brought these people of God to exile, grief and woe for nearly 2,000 years? Could it be nothing less than the rejection of the Messiah nationally. Right, absolutely. That's a question to answer. That's why when I talk to Jews and say, well, they know about Jesus and they think his philosophy was good, I said, no, no, he's not a philosopher. He taught a way. He taught a way of connecting so your spirit would know in your daily circumstances exactly which way you should go. He teaches you how you continue in the way. It's not a, a noun, it's a verb. And uh, people don't get that. They think that, that spirituality is something you put in a box or a bottle and you just apply it like cream to your face so you look good. No, it's not. No, the crux of the matter is it's by faith in our Creator's mercy that we are saved, trusting in Yeshua's sacrifice as the full and complete payment for every wrong we've ever done. And it's only when we understand how bad sin is that we will understand how great Yeshua's sacrifice was. Yeah, and the only way you can sin is against the Creator, not against man or anything else. That's true. So sin is only against your own Creator. Amazing. Hopefully these truths will sink in and you realize that my ancestor was when the Kohen Gadol out of the Sanhedrin became a believer. He and his family, the Naimas, left when the Romans came and they lived. And I'm his descendant because they believed. And we did not suffer the Holocaust.